Well, good morning. Welcome to the Urbana United Methodist Churches, both in person and online service of worship. We're glad you've chosen to be with us today. And as we like to remind ourselves each and every week, God is good all the time. Oh, man. Uh, so, um, again, welcome. And for those of you worshiping online, if you haven't already, we hope you'll take a moment and uh, greet one another in the comment section, whether you're on Facebook or YouTube. A reminder, once again, for us worshiping in person, you may also uh, welcome those worshiping online by doing the same thing, taking your cell phones and in the comment section, extending greeting to those online as well. And we hope, uh, following worship today, uh, that you'll take a moment to uh, extend greeting to those around you uh, before you leave this morning. If you're new and joining us for the first time, a special welcome. We're delighted that you've chosen to be with us and certainly hope you'll continue to do so in the future. And now let us check in with Cliff and Molly for our weekly family ministry update. Let's watch. Good morning, guys, and welcome back to another Sunday Fun Day recap with the whole Meadows clan. And I lost my tooth. My and Ryan tooth. lost another tooth. Yeah. All right. Choir in the making. So, last week we began a new series called The Big Give, with the main point God always has a plan. This week we'll dig into the book of Luke and focus on the main point anything is possible with God. And last week, the preschoolers learned Jesus is God's son with the story of the angel and Mary in the book of Luke. This week, they learned Jesus is God's son with the story of when he was born. So we hope you guys can join us at 1030 a.m. downstairs or online at 715 p.m. Have a great week. See you guys. Oh, my. All right. You never know, do you, with the Meadows clan gets together. So... Thank you, Meadows family, for that family ministry update. Uh, and now, uh, let us prepare our hearts for worship as Karen leads us in our morning prelude. Thank you, Karen, for your ministry of music this morning. And now, if you are able, uh, I invite you to stand as we continue our worship by celebrating the uh, lighting of the Advent wreath responsibly this morning. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom. Like this crocus, it shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. A highway shall be there, and it shall be called the holy way. 
The unclean shall not travel on it, but it shall be for God's people. No traveler, not even fools, shall go astray. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. The prophet Isaiah tells us about the joy of ascending to God's house. The prophet tells us to imagine being set free, being unburdened, being released to live, to fully live in the grace and wonder of life itself, surrounded by those who love us like no one else. And then he tells us that the journey to get there is just as much a joy. The psalmist says, Happy are these whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord, who made heaven and earth, who keeps faith, who executes justice, gives food, sets prisoners free, opens eyes, lifts up, watches over, upholds. The Lord will reign forever, your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord. The candles of joyous hope proclaim peace and deep and everlasting joy have been lighted as a sign that we are those who walk with a skip in our step because we can see the destination and it is pure joy. We are ascending to God's promise. Let us worship God. O oh, come, all ye faithful. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we gather together on this, the third Sunday of Advent, we remember again the coming of your Son Jesus into our world, and we recall the coming of Jesus into our hearts 
and minds. So, Father, we praise you for this great gift that you have extended to us, the gift of your Son, Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah. And so we just ask that you send your Holy Spirit on all of us as we worship you this time and just continue to guide and uplift us so that as we leave this place, we'll be revived and renewed and ready to serve you in all that we do. And now with the confidence of children of God, let us join in that prayer. Our Lord Jesus taught us, praying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Thank you, choir and Karen. So as you just had that joyful, joyful song saying to us, I want to talk about some simple joys in life. And I have my own opinion on what a simple joy in life is, such as popping bubble wrap, right? Or freshly washed clothes with a really great fabric softener right out of the dryer. Now those are mine. But I recently polled Facebook to see what Facebook had to say, and many of you responded. And here are the top responses for simple joys in life. The overwhelming response was new, fresh sheets. Anybody on that camp right there? A couple of you, okay. The first sip of coffee in the morning. 
Okay? All right. So we're, we're right on track. When something was clean before you ever had to ask to clean it. That was another big one. <laughs> New books. New books. Fresh Play-Doh. Any Play-Doh? <laughs> I thought that was, there was there were multiple times in there, fresh Play-Dohs. Uh, and then warm clothes out the dryer. Yeah? Or a towel maybe, right? Um, I will also add my, another favorite, and probably my most favorite, is brand new socks. There is something about brand new socks. But some things that come new also come with a bit of discomfort or even pain to get used to. Not like new socks, but another thing I like are new shoes, right? New shoes take some time to wear in and, and, and get your feet. I have like Shrek feet, so they're like really big and kind of like have to find their crevices to find in the, sh- the shoe. Um, but there is discomfort and pain in those new shoes over time. And I also think about a new relationship where there's pain and discomfort at times. I remember being so excited to marry Becca, uh, and it was mostly pure joy, right, leading up to those moments. There's chaos, and there's, you know, confusion with the wedding stuff and planning. Uh, But it's mostly pure joy until you move in with that person and start realizing how actual people live beside yourself, right? Uh, How much hair can be captured on one hairbrush, or who leaves the toilet seat up or down, But probably the biggest point of contention I think we had, that pain, that discomfort, that new relationship, was when it came to the holidays, that first year. Oh, I can't wait till we go see my family on on Thanksgiving Day. Well, I go to my family on Thanksgiving Day. Well, what about Christmas? I go to my, well, what about Christmas? And it was back and forth, right? We had to figure and work through this pain and discomfort, this, this growing pain, right? And growing pains, we know those. We know what growing pains feel like. You probably don't really understand it as a kid when you're laying in your bed and your, your legs are aching or your arms are aching, but I'm experiencing now with that with my children. But your bones are literally stretching, right? Your muscles are tearing and reconnecting to grow into the person you're becoming. Because there is always growing pains when a new thing happens, like a new pair of shoes or a new relationship or as your body changes. Pain in the preparation is part of the process. You know, scriptures are full of stories of pain being part of processes for God to do this new thing in the lives of the people. We read in the Old Testament the story of the Jewish people, the journey from covenant, their first commitment with God, and just a few short moments later walking away from that covenant to seeing them being captured, exiled, and then delivered. The story of conquering and being conquered. This journey of freedom only to go and get enslaved once again. In the book of Isaiah, there is this recounting of part of this journey of the Jewish people, this back-and-forth relationship with God. And the speaker in the scripture is the prophet Isaiah, and he recounted part of this story while reminding the remi- reader, remind the reader, prepare for a new thing. Here he's reminding the people of Israel when they were slaves in Egypt, and God delivered them to a person named Moses. A powerful story of captives being set free by the power of God, and a reminder of where they were and what was yet to come. In Isaiah 43, 15 through 19, we read this. I am the Lord, your Holy One, Israel's creator and king. I am the Lord, who opened a way through the waters, making a dry path through the sea. I called forth the mighty army of Egypt with all its chariots and horses. I drew them beneath the waves, and they drowned, their lives snuffed out like a smoldering candle wick. But forget all that. It's nothing compared to what I'm going to do. For I am about to do something new. See, I have already begun. Do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness. I'll create rivers in dry wasteland. The prophet Isaiah reminded the people that God has had done amazing things in the past, swallowing up this Egyptian army and parting the seas that God was doing these awesome things time and time again. But the reminder here is, 
don't dwell on what he did before. Get ready and prepare yourself for a new thing. See, this is never to discount what God did, but it is a promise of what God is going to do. Again, in verses 18 and 19, we hear this. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. See, I am doing a new thing, making streams in the deserts. Have you ever felt those dry moments in your life before? You feel as if there's not much excitement going on, that maybe God feels distant, or maybe all the things are going wrong. Maybe you feel as there's no quenching your thirst, that you are in a dry, parched desert with no relief in sight. You ever have a week where if one more thing breaks, you feel like you might as well just burn it all down and walk away? You ever have one of those weeks? That was our week last week. Our, uh, we had a closet rack fall that we had to repair. We had a dishwasher that we had to repair. And we had a pop tire that we still haven't yet repaired. <laughs> all in the same week. But maybe that wasn't your week. Maybe you haven't had a close friend in a long time. Or you feel stuck at your job. Or maybe you feel like your dating life or your marriage is hopeless. See, it's easy to get frustrated and distracted by desert wastelands in front of you. How do we expect God to do a new thing in the desert? How do we go into the new season that God has prepared us for? Well, that word, prepare. We must prepare our hearts. See, the way we narrate our lives can determine our future. If we continuously cling to the way things used to be in former glories, we can miss out on a new miracle that God wants to do. You know, it's never comfortable leaving the known for the unknown. I think about the hobbits in the Shire. They had this comfortable place to live, but yet they went on this journey into the unknown. Or Lewis and Clark, who set out to explore the Louisiana Purchase. They knew what they knew as safe in the city and, and what their, their, um, their relationships and comfort there, but then they had to go into the wilderness. Or the Apollo missions, Right? Going into the unknown. God promises to bring new life in those unknown moments. But if we continue to dwell in past, our future can't take root to new life. Preparing for God the new thing is the foundation of growing. You know, thank God Jesus didn't leave us where he found us. Thank God he didn't leave this church where he found it. Thank God he hasn't left this world where he found it. You know, we've all fallen short and missed the glory of God at times, and in our error, we've even made it worse. But God didn't leave us there. He did a new thing. But every new thing that God does, has done has taken someone's heart to say yes, to prepare for that new thing. And as we move into this new season of our church, we know we need our hearts to say yes to preparing room for what God wants to do. You know, we know there will be growing pains, right? We know there will be discomfort. We know there will be plenty of unknowns. And yet we're not alone in those feelings. These are the same feelings that the people of Israel had when Jesus began introducing a new thing. In Matthew chapter 9, 10 through 16, we read this. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? It's the first new thing they recognized. They weren't used to that. They were not used to the religious elite eating with those who were not. That's the first thing they noticed, right? On hearing this, Jesus said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Then John's disciples came and asked him, how is it 
that we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast. There's another question. This is not normal. Why don't you fast like the rest of us? You, we always used to do this thing, and now you're not doing this thing. Jesus answered, how can the guests of the bridegroom mourn while he is still with them? The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. Then they will fast. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch will pull away from the garment, making the tear worse. Neither do people pour new wine into old wine skins. If they do, the skins will burst. The wine will run out and the wine skins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins, and both are preserved. See, these questions arose against this, this new way Jesus was doing things. Questions of why people weren't doing what they've always done before. Have we ever heard that? Why are you doing that? We've always done it this way, right? And if Jesus gives the answer of new wine and new wineskins, right, if you put new wine in the old wineskins, he says they will do what? They'll burst, and they'll run over, and they'll be all over the ground. Jesus gave them a new thing, not a religion to follow, but that relationship to invest in. Jesus knew the fruit of this new thing, this new wine, right? Where there is new wine, there was freedom and power that couldn't fit in the old wineskins. And when Jesus came to earth, he upset that normality. The faith of the Jewish tradition was bent on sacrifice and orderly traditions of meals and festivals and rituals. It worked for about 2,000 years, but then Jesus was born, and he told them that their worship determined their relationship with God. And once he entered the scene, the world really wasn't ready for what Jesus had to offer. You know, we are about to celebrate this arrival of Jesus in these coming days. The King of Kings had no grand welcome. The arrival was not announced by scribes or town criers. Remember, there was no room even at the inn, and he was brought into this world in a barn. But 30 years later, Jesus starts to rework what had been in place for 2,000 years. All the Jewish laws and traditions had grown into this legalistic transition and, and, and ritual. And the Jewish people were so ingrained in that tradition that they began to wield these laws as weapons and gotcha moments. Jesus looked at all these laws and traditions and summed them up in the two. Matthew 22, 23 through 40, we read this. That same day, the Sadducees, who said there is no resurrection, came to him with a question. Teacher, they said, Moses told us that if a man dies without having children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up offspring for him. Now there were seven brothers among us. The first one married and died, and since he had no children, he left his wife to his brother. The same thing happened to the second and the third brother, right on down to the seventh. Finally, the woman died. Now then, at the resurrection, whose wife shall be of the seven, since all of them were married to her? Quite the story that these guys drummed up, right? <laughs> what a gotcha moment they're trying to trap Jesus in. Jesus replied, you are in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. At the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like, not angels, like the angels, right? In marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like them, sorry, like the angels in heaven. But about the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what God said to you? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. When the crowd heard this, they were astonished in his teaching. And in hearing this, Jesus knew what they were really up to. He had silenced the Sadducees. Then the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. See, this old guard of the Jewish faith was threatened by the freedom and access that Jesus proclaimed. Jesus dismantled this religious elite and tradition and created freedom for the, for the gospel to be spread. He disrupted what was known. 
Now, I can only imagine the feeling of those who are very comfortable in a system, how they felt, these Pharisees, Sadducees, and people who were just faithful Jewish worshipers. The old ways or even the old wineskins what were, was what was known and what had worked. And the nation of Israel had become ingrained in knowing that these laws, that they missed the whole purpose. Now, this can easily happen to us, can't it? It's happened to the Jewish faith. It's happened in the church. It's happened in our church. Moments of seeing this desert and not believing that God can make it an oasis. Following our traditions instead of following the Holy Spirit. Trying to fit new wine into old wine skins. So how do we prepare for God to do a new thing in our church? How do we do this without falling into the traps of comfort and the things that are known? As we're preparing, preparing for the season of Christmas, we celebrate Christ coming to earth. Are we at the same time preparing for God to do a new thing in our hearts? And if he's doing a new thing in our hearts, why can't we ask God to continue to do a new thing in our church? You know, we're clearly in a season of transition, as I said, at our church. One that can cause questions, anxieties, misunderstandings. But as we lean into this new season, we have to trust God in the unknown. Amen? We have to trust God in the unknown. Amen? And as God comes in our midst, we must ask him to do it again. Because he's done it before, hasn't he? We must ask God to make streams in the desert. To bring us new wineskins for the new wine that God is going to supply. We must ask God for fresh vision and fresh leadership for this new season. Are we praying for this? Are we seeking God for this? Are we leading if we're feeling called to lead into this? And I believe there's a few things we can recognize as guideposts for us as we seek God in doing this new thing in our church. The first is this. Don't depend on your past successes. Now, our church has had an amazing history and amazing moments. You know, Methodists entered this town 220 years ago, started in log cabins and moved into smaller buildings and moved in again to smaller buildings and had a church knocked down by a tornado and built another one. And it's continued this legacy. Again, we see their names on the windows of people who are faithful to what God had called them to do. We've seen them be part of the Underground Railroad. We've seen food pantries. We've seen movie theaters. We've seen youth programs, outreaches, VBS, choirs, music programs, Sunday schools, mission trips, and mission projects. We've seen God do amazing things through a people called Urbana United Methodist Church. And although we can be super proud of that and knowing that God has used us and that God did a thing, we can't hang our hat on that and say we have arrived, can we? We can't say we're good with where we're at. We know that God is not done with us and is just getting started with, again, these people called Urbana UMC. We know that God wants to do even greater things. We know he will make streams in the desert. We know if we're still here, he's not done. Amen? This is never to discount what God did, but it is a promise. It is a promise of what God is going to do. So let's celebrate the work that God has done, but let's continue to look forward and ask, what's next, God? Do it again, God. Make a stream in the desert, God. And the second thing is don't let your past failures conquer you. And although we've had some amazing moments in our church, we've also made mistakes. We've also had failures. We know we're not perfect We've had plenty of down moments and those amazing up moments, haven't we? We recognize our faults humbly, not to dwell on our failures and, and let them define us, but to recognize that we are always defined by the grace and power of Jesus Christ. 
We know we will have failures going forward. We know we will have difficult moments. We will know we will stub our toe and bang it and say things we probably wish we didn't say. That's never happened to any of you banging your toe on a door. Come on now, be honest. We know the church is not perfect, but we have a perfect Jesus. Amen? We have a perfect Jesus, and he has said that the church is the hope of the world. The church, as dysfunctional and crazy as we can all be, it's the hope of the world. So let's invite Jesus into that conversation. Let's invite Jesus into us praying and seeking and asking, God, what's next? And the last is don't judge future successes by our present view. If we find ourselves in a desert, don't doubt that it can become an oasis. Again, Isaiah, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am going to do a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. See, sometimes the view in front of us can prevent us from imagining the bright future that God has for us. It could be an economy. It could be a denomination. It could be a new pastor or losing a great pastor or anything else that can distract or distort your view. I'm not saying what is in front of you is always bad or negative. I'm just saying it's not the end result. It's not the final destination. We can find ourselves looking at what is happening right now with our transitions and wonder about our future. But don't be so consumed by that current view that we miss our future one. Let's invite God in and ask and help, him, help us prepare room for us to ask, God, do that new thing in us once again. Do something again in our church, Urbana UMC, that you've done over 220 years. It's still here. You're not done with it, right? Let's invite God in there and ask him. Help us prepare our hearts for what's next. So I want to close with a couple questions. Are we ready for God to do a new thing in our church? Are we ready for God to do a new thing in our church. What is God calling you to do to prepare for this new season? We're all going to feel different stirrings and callings. Don't neglect it. Don't push it away and say, well, that's for somebody else. No, lean into it. Because I know God didn't call just me here. He called all of us here, didn't he? Didn't he? So what's he calling you to do in this new season as we move forward? As God does this new thing in our church, it will take all of us. This is not one person's church. It's not one pastor's church. It's not one generation's church. It's not one traditional church or contemporary services church. It is a collective effort to what God wants to do in our community. It's multi-generational congregation full of ministers of the good news of Jesus Christ. Are we ready for God to do a new thing in our church? Let me pray for us. God, you are making streams and deserts. That is what you are in the business of. We thank you for the history of this place. We thank you for the legacy that's happened in these four walls and beyond. But we also thank you, God, for our bright future. Because it's you who leads the church, Jesus. It's your spirit through us. A bunch of people who really have no business leading. <laughs> but you use us. And you're faithful. Prepare room in our hearts, God, to ask those questions. What are you calling me to do in this next season? What are you calling my group of friends, my small groups, my Bible studies? What are you calling our choir, our, our worship team? What are you calling our men's group, our women's group? What are you calling our youth ministry, our children's ministry? What are you calling our food pantry to do in this next season, God, that we haven't seen you do yet? 
We thank you for your faithfulness, God. We thank you that the story continues, Jesus. Not because of something we've done, but because you are faithful. We thank you for this church. We thank you for this season of preparation, of Advent, knowing the promise of the King, the Christ child is coming. We can lean into that. In all these unknown moments in our life, this is the one thing we know for sure. But you're a good God who loves us. And you don't leave us where you find us, but you bring us along as you mold us and shape us to look like you. Do that again in our church, Jesus. Amen. And as we move into our time of offering, you'll see a few ways that you can give to support the mission and vision here at Urbana UMC of reaching people far from God by igniting faith through service. You can text to give, you can give online, you can follow along with all the things we do with our app and give safely and securely there, or you can also give in the baskets as you leave the sanctuary today or drop it off at the church office during the week. But your gifts, week in and week out, make the ministries, church in action possible. It is the life blood of what God is doing here. It's what buys the curriculum for our children's ministry downstairs. It puts gas in our bus as we go to drive our youth to ice skating later this month. It keeps the heat and AC on for our kids in our preschool center. It provides leadership for the warehouse food pantry. And your gifts added to the gifts of others, that generosity that swells up inside of us, right? When it's added to others, it fuels the mission of God's church. So thank you for being a part of the lifeblood of this congregation. And I want to remind you again about the upcoming opportunity to give to the Christmas offering. You know, 40% of our offering this year will go to the warehouse food pantry food budget. Uh, Throughout the year, we distribute tons and tons of food to families in need. And 30% of our offering this year will go to the Vacation Bible School Outreach that we do every summer that reaches around 100 kids and, and even more families. And the last is going towards Toledo Faith Outreach Center in Belize, with Pastor Victor Hernandez, who really just had a really tough month, is what I just heard, losing a son-in-law at the age of 40 and lots of flooding in Belize. But knowing those gifts will support their Happy Birthday Jesus initiative next year as we gain supplies throughout the, the, the year of 2023. So that is our Christmas offering. And we also have our general fund that we're supporting each week. So thank you for your faithfulness in that. But thank you for preparing your hearts for our Christmas Eve offering coming forward. Would you pray with me this morning? God, we do thank you for these gifts. We thank you for these ministries that happen week in and week out because people are faithful in knowing that you use what we give to fuel mission. God, we thank you for our Christmas Eve offering and our Christmas Eve celebration coming this year, knowing that you're going to do a great thing there with our nativity scene, our caroling, our outreach to our community, and our kids program. And we thank you for our choir and and the music that will celebrate and honor you in welcoming the king to our world at Christmas Eve. We ask that you bless this offering and our Christmas Eve offering to come. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Christopher, for bringing God's word to us this morning. And as we uh, begin to wrap things up, I have a few announcements to share with us uh, this morning. First, um, if you are new to the Urbana United Methodist Church, Again, as we shared at the beginning, we're glad you've chosen to worship with us. But if you're new, you're a new attender, and you have yet to fill out a Connect card, we invite you to go to our church website, and there's a link at the top where you can select and and fill one out there for us. Or you can simply text the word NEW to our text number 937-563-4593. And if today is your first time checking us out in person, if you haven't uh, received a gift yet, we invite you to stop by the uh, welcome station in the narthex, and uh, we have a gift there we'd like to share with you. And don't forget that we have pizza with the pastors on the second Sunday of each month, and this is a chance for new attenders to meet some of the church leadership, learn more about our church, and ask any questions you might have about the mission and ministry of Urbana United Methodist Church. 
Now, to register, just uh, text the word pizza to that same text number that you see on the screen. And today is the second Sunday, and I know we are uh, having pizza. So uh, if you would like to join, you haven't signed up, uh, I'm sure we won't run out of pizza. Right, Christopher? So there we go. Invite you to be a part of that. <clears throat> now, we are uh, continue uh, accepting donations of hats, scarves, gloves, and mittens to be distributed to persons through the warehouse food pantry coming up here uh, in a couple of weeks. So we invite you, if you haven't uh, had a chance to put anything on the tree, the tree is located on the main level outside the parlor. You can hang your mittens, gloves, whatever. You can just lay them at the base of the tree. Uh, the donations will be received through next Sunday, December 18th. And our Christmas Eve service schedule this year begins at 6 p.m. with a live nativity scene. And we have all kinds of cool animals uh, this year, uh, from camels to, to sheep. So uh, I hope you'll come out and be a part of that and enjoy it. Uh, there will also be hot drinks and snacks that people can enjoy and carolers singing uh, during the live nativity scene. And then following that, at 7 p.m., we have our uh, in-person family candlelight service and then uh, a traditional carols and candlelight service at 11 p.m. So a lot of opportunity to be involved in celebrating the coming of the King, Jesus Christ himself, on Christmas Eve. And on Christmas Day, in addition to an online service that we are in the process of creating for Christmas Day, there will be an in-person ecumenical Christmas Day worship service at the Episcopal Church of the Epiphany here in Urbana beginning at 10 a.m. So area churches are coming together uh, to celebrate the birth of a king. There'll be a lot of, uh, you know, Christmas carols and other music and readings. And uh, uh, another way to think of this is um, sometimes, you know, persons want to go to the traditional candlelight service at 11, but you might think, well, it's just too late. I really don't want to get out, go out that late. Don't like driving that time. Well, then you come to the Christmas Day service at 10, and uh, it's just a little more convenient. So, so you've got options as we remember the greatest gift ever given, Jesus Christ himself. Uh, and so we hope for the Christmas Day in-person service at the Episcopal Church, you'll join Tammy and me and many others in our worship together that day. Uh, and so now, to close us out, here's Amy. All right, as we continue our worship this morning, stand if you are able, and we'll sing hymn number 140, Great is Thy Faithfulness. <laughs>
pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for all that you've done for us in the past. You have been so faithful to us here at Urbana United Methodist Church. And as we go from this place today, we ask that our hearts will be open to what you have for us as your children and as a part of this congregation. As we prepare for the celebration of your son's birth and what that means to us as believers, let us also prepare for what you have for us. And as we reflect on the past, help us to look forward to the new things you have for us in the future. We are your people and our hearts are ready for you. In Jesus' name, amen.